Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for being with us this evening for our conversation, which is essentially focusing on coming nearly to 100 years of insulin, how do we deliver universal access and equity of care to anyone wherever they need it? A hundred years ago, Banting and Best out of Canada gave us a tool to address diabetes. It is no longer protected by patents. There are not very great significant barriers in its availability as far as production is concerned. And yet we find many, many people, the latest Diabetes Atlas, which you all have had, the, had a chance to have a look at, will indicate dark spots on the planet where people either don't have access to insulin or are rationing out the available insulin for their day-to-day -day use. Earlier this year, in September, on the sidelines of the UN General Assembly, the founder of Biocon and Biocon Biologics, Kiran Mazumdar Shaw, stood up and said, this is untenable. That coming nearly to a century of insulin being available, that people do not have access to it whenever they require it, and there is no equitable distribution of insulin. And I want to underscore and repeat that word that she had used then there. It is untenable. And so therefore, at this IDF symposium, we would like all of you, all of us together, to consider how we move forward. We've got less than a thousand days to get to a century of insulin. Is it going to be business as usual? Or are we going to do things differently? Are we going to think in terms of our business practices and market operations? Or are we going to think about the people whose lives are not going to be significantly improved if they don't have access to insulin? Are we going to work in partnership in order to make sure that there are no dark spots? To set us on this conversation, we have the privilege this evening, in addition to our distinguished speakers, whom I will introduce shortly, the Deputy Chief of Mission, our Deputy Ambassador of India to Korea, join us this evening. Thank you, Mr. Sivan, for making the time to be with us. And I would like him to actually set us off with a set of introductory remarks from the perspective of both a country that's known to the world as the pharmacy to the world, but also from a perspective of what it means to make affordable access to high quality medicines, especially insulin, available to the rest of the world. So without taking much of any one of our times, Mr. Sivan, if you could come forward, deliver your remarks, and then I will introduce the um, speakers and have them up on the stage. Yes, sir. It's a pleasure to join you all for the symposium organized by <clears throat> Biocon Biologics on the title, 100 Years of Insulin, Delivering on Universal Access and Equitable Care. Uh, when Bobby asked me to uh, deliver the remarks at the symposium, I was not, really not sure uh, what I should be saying on such a technical matter. Um, uh, though the discussions will be science and, uh, and uh, academics, uh, we all know that universal health care is an issue of uh, policy and of partnerships. 
uh, before I get into the efforts made in this arena, especially by Biocon under the leadership of an Indian icon, Ms. Kiran Majumdar Shaw, I would like to briefly uh, <clears throat> touch upon my government's efforts to ensure universal health care and how Biocon's efforts uh, reflects the as aspirations of Indian government and vice versa. Though universal health care has been a goal for my government for over 70 years of our independent existence, uh, two recent, uh, recent initiatives uh, is worth mentioning in this forum. The first is the mission Indra Dhanush, which my government launched in the year 2014 uh, and aimed to achieve 90% full immunization coverage in India and sustain the same by the year 2020. I'm happy to state that by between the years 2014 and 2018, India's annual immunization growth rate had risen to 4% with an unprecedented 16% rise in the number of fully immunized children. Some figures place the full immunization coverage at 83% by the end of last year. In the year 2018, we launched the second initiative called <clears throat> Aishman Bharat, which had two verticals. One was to establish health and wellness centers, and one was to give the protection to people. But under the uh, health and wellness center vertical, we, had we have established 150,000 wellness centers, uh, which provides insurance coverage to about 40% of the population, nearly 500 million people, or roughly the equivalent of the entire population of e European Union. On the health coverage part, uh, <clears throat> we have been able uh, to reach about 3.9 million Indians and about uh, they, have, they have taken advantage of cashless treatment resulting in savings of 1.6 billion uh, uh, families benefiting, uh, uh, 1.6 billion dollars in benefits to families. However, there are challenges in healthcare uh, value chain in India, including gaps in healthcare and in infrastructure, uh, divergence between rural and urban geographies, an acute shortage of skilled workers and inadequate public funding, to name a few. While this is understandable, while targeting a population of 1.3 billion, we are committed to addressing this and make steady progress towards this <coughs> uh, sustainable development goal. Why do I mention this? These two initiatives reflect the aspiration of the government of India to make healthcare universally accessible to everybody. Friends, India has been rightfully called the pharmacy capital of the world, as Bobby just mentioned because of its consistent track record in producing high quality, affordably priced uh, pharmaceutical products for the world. With advances in biological therapeutics, India has seen companies like Biocon become world leaders in developing biosimilar therapeutic entities, especially for diabetes and cancer. This is now recognized globally, earning uh, approvals from stringent medical regulators like the US FDA, European Medical Agency, and the Japanese Regulating Agency. In particular, congratulations to Bi Biocon Biologics for the first biosimilar Trastuzumab approval from the US FDA yesterday. This shows the company's commitment to quality and for working on enabling affordable access, the theme for the symposium today. India is committed to its core philosophy of Sarve Santu Nirmaya of universal health. It is this worldview that efforts from Bio Biocon Biologics reflects of enabling access to insulin, something that should have been achieved, as Bobby again mentioned, much earlier in its 100 years of existence. With over 50 million diabetic, or 70 million, uh, as I learned just now, diabetes uh, patients in the country, and the number expected to grow steadily, universal access to insulin is a need of the hour for all Indians. It is never too late to do the right thing. My best wishes to all those who have pledged to achieve it today. Thank you. Mr. Sivan, thank you so much for those very kind words and recognition that you have brought to um, Biocon Biologics and to all of us here. Thank you so much also for calling out the need and the scale of what needs to yet be done. The numbers are indeed staggering. Um, but if we go by the achievements that you have underscored, which is 83% coverage with immunization for all children, and our birth cohort is about 26 million kids annually, it is possible and we are encouraged. So therefore, um, we will take to heart your encouragement that at least as far as India is concerned, we will have near universal um, access availability 
to high quality insulin um, in the near future. We will continue to work alongside with you. We have four very distinguished folks with us right now, and I want to invite them onto the stage. Um, may I call on Dr. Radhakrishnan Sodhiratnam from Malaysia? <laughs> Professor Earl Hirsch from the University of Washington in Seattle. <laughs> Ms. Renza Shibila from Melbourne, Australia. and Dr. Sandeep Atale, the Chief Medical Officer of Biocon, um, onto the stage. For those of you that are members and delegates to the IDF, you know that there is a board meeting currently on, and that precludes um, Professor Andrew Bolton from being with us at the beginning of this session, even though that's how we had planned for the flow of uh, our evening's proceedings. He will join us as soon as the board meeting is over and we would expect him to then join all four of uh, our distinguished panelists up on stage. Um, I'm going to do something that uh, the UN generally does, which is saying all protocols observed, which means I'm not going to steal anybody's time, especially our speaker's time, by putting their bios and reading them out. Each of them are either known to you personally or they are known to you via their publications and their works. They are pillars of the diabetes response in their respective parts of the world and for our global efforts. And so therefore, all protocols observed, sirs, ma'am, I won't eat up your time. What I would do is turn to Professor Radha, uh, Dr. Radha uh, Krishnan Sodhiratnam to start us off with his presentation, and then we will go one by one through all the presentations, and then we will get into a time of discussion. Take us on our journey, please, Dr. Radhakrishnan. Okay, thank you, Dr. Bobby, and uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's a privilege to be standing up front here in front of all of you. It's an honor for me to be given the uh, privilege actually to kickstart the proceedings of the evening. And before I start on the journey from clinical trials to the real world evidence, uh, it might be useful for us to remember that 100 years ago, when Frederick Banting took his journey from the UK to come all the way to Canada, and to work under the tutelage of John James McLeod. It was the beginning of a very, uh, I would say, a journey of what insulin has become today. And this journey, I think we should appreciate the fact that from Denmark, later on a gentleman called August Naff came over to Canada, looked for John McLeod, and with his permission, took the insulin back to Denmark and started treating patients over there in 1923. So we should appreciate this fact that not only is insulin a discovery that has changed the lives of mankind, insulin's journey is something that has been a journey of collaboration, sincerity, and making it something that will change the lives of our patients. We are all here today. All of you are here with me today because we have a passion for treating diabetes, if not getting our patients on insulin. And this we should appreciate, the collaboration that comes with it. And I feel uh, that today, I hope, uh, you know, whatever I'm going to say must make sense because we have to support this mission of 10 cents. Because if we have all the passion, we have you know, all our deliberations today, are not going to make a difference if we don't put it into action. So without further ado, I think I have to get to the matters of the business of the day. And as a clinician, right now, if I may have to make a choice, what can I offer my patient? Is it going to be the reference insulin or is it going to be a biosimilar insulin? 
question is, when and why does this question really need to arise? And I would put it to you, uh, it's the cost that always you know, makes us uh, get hit on the head and really tells us to wake up and say, hey, what are we doing here? Now, this is data from Malaysia published in the Malaysian Medical Journal in 2017. And this is an undertaking by the Ministry of Health Malaysia to see where are our resources going. And as you can see very clearly, the outpatient treatment for diabetes only consumes something like uh, US dollars, 120 million per year to treat diabetes in Malaysia. But the cost that we incur in treating the complications is mind-blowing. We are spending something like three, uh, sorry, 230 million US dollars just to treat the complications. So we are putting our eggs, obviously, in the wrong basket. Now, this is the nice IDF data. I'm making comparisons, not just on the cost, between 2010 and 2017 at what Malaysia is doing. And just to focus on uh, certain pertinent aspects of the data, you can see in the last seven years, the prevalence of diabetes in Malaysia has gone up fourfold. The numbers of patients with diabetes have gone up fivefold. But we've done seemingly a good job preventing people from dying of diabetes. And that might be because you know, if we are going to be so good with insulin, as you can see, uh, later on I will show you in the last panel, we are actually putting a lot of patients on insulin, but in order to do that, we are probably looking at the big picture. We are also looking at cardiorenal risk. And perhaps by treating our patients adequately with statins, with ACE inhibitors, we are able actually to keep our patients from dying. But the, you know, that comes at a cost. So you can see very clearly the cost has gone up three times. Okay? Now, when we look at some of the data at how well you know, uh, we are doing, actually, uh, to produce these uh, numbers of preventing death, and here's where, from the National Diabetes Registry of Malaysia, you can see we have put 11% of our patients in 2010 on insulin. We have increased that two and a half times to 28%, but we've gotten nowhere. Very clearly, you can see, ladies and gentlemen, the average prevailing HbA1c is uh, not budging from 8.2. Likewise, the percentage number of patients treated to a target A1c of 6.5 or below is not increasing. So that tells us one thing. We know how to use, or rather, we can use insulin. We can increase the use of insulin, but it's not getting us the glycemic effects that we want. Now, I also put another column on the last end of it on the use of the insulins that uh, are prevalent in uh, primary care. And as you can see, 90% of the patients in primary care are receiving human insulin, and that seems to be the same seven years on. So these are the things we need to take into cognizance. The minute we are going to change policy, we are, the minute we are going to think about how can we get a better molecule, perhaps. And if that molecule is going to make any difference to our patients' outcomes. So when we are thinking about biosimilars, of course, a clinician, a few things run in their minds. And one would be, is it approved globally? We would like, you know, of course, to have the major regulatory authorities to put the stamp on it. It gives us confidence to a certain extent. But then we also want to know how the molecule behaves. And that's where assay tests makes a difference because we need to look at the bioequivalence of this new molecule versus the innovator in terms of its pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics. And while we are very well versed with, you know, we are quite safe with the safety data from the innovator, we absolutely have very little data about how a new molecule manufactured in a totally different process is actually going to show up any problems, we don't know. And the numbers that, even if they are available, are pretty small. The next thing is, we would like to know whether the clinical studies that matter to our patients whom we see have been done. Because we are not simply going to uh, you know, start putting uh, something when we don't know whether there's any evidence to support what we are doing. And last but not least, 
you know, in certain situations, especially in the public sector, it's a matter of now switching. So we would like to have data to tell us with confidence that we could do this. So these are the things that run into our mind. And when we look at the insulin glygine biosimilar development program that's being run by Biocon, it's interesting to know that they have developed studies to show us with confidence how their molecule is going to do. So the phase one studies, we have got a global PKPD study as well as a PKPD study in the Japanese population. Now Japan is a very unique market and uh, you know, whenever any molecule gets into the market, they are very strict that it must be done in Japanese population. We also have phase three studies. I will describe to you the INSTRIDE 1 study, which is looking at the safety and efficacy of biosimilar insulin glagine in type one diabetes patients. INSTRIDE 2 is a similar study looking at the safety and efficacy of uh, biosimilar insulin glagine in type two diabetes patients. INSTRIDE 1, sometimes referred to as INSTRIDE 3, is a switch study because patients who were completing the INSTRIDE 1 study, type 1 patients, at the end of that study, they were put into a study where they were compared with one arm of the patients not switching and another arm of, a, of the uh, patients switching between the biosimilar to the reference and back to the biosimilar. And then we are seeing if there are any differences. And of course, the post-marketing surveillance studies are necessary. And this, I feel, is something that empowers each country, each nation to ensure that if they are thinking of bringing in a substitute or bringing in a new molecule for their patients, they must be satisfied like Japan. So the post-marketing surveillance study done in Malaysia was actually a prerequisite for the registration of biosimilar insulin glagine in Malaysia, without which it will not get approval. And that is why we do not have Bezagla in Malaysia, because they're not prepared to do this study. So we want to see for ourselves, for our own patients, we must have a study that shows safety and efficacy. So this is a point that probably you know, will resonate in countries in which they do not have any regulations at all. And this is a bit tricky because you could bring in uh, any biosimilar and they could show you studies which we don't know how credible they may be. And here you are, you're not really sure whether your patients are going to be safe with it or not. So here showing now the global map about uh, where studies have been done and collectively we have got about six clinical trials and about 2,000 patients in 20 countries exposed to biosimilar insulin glagine with manufactured by Biocon. So let's get into the nitty gritty of uh, these studies. And this is a, t uh, a study to show the comparative pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics of biosimilar insulin glagine with the reference insulin glagine in patients with type one diabetes. Now this study, very interesting because what you're going to look for is the PK and the, P, uh, the PD profiles to demonstrate bioequivalence between the biosimilar insulin glagene and two reference insulin glagenes available in North America as well as Europe. Now, this study is pretty interesting. They recruited 114 patients with type 1 diabetes. It was a single center, randomized, double blind, single dose, three way crossover. This is interesting. And uh, how did they uh, analyze the, uh, uh, the PKPD data were by hyperinsulinemic euglycemic clamp studies. Now, as you can see in the, in, the, uh, in the diagram, a patient who is recruited and started on biosimilar insulin will be switched to the European insulin glagene and then switched to the US insulin glagene. And at three time points, the first clamp, second clamp, and third clamps would be done to get comparative data on how these three different insulins perform. Now, insulin glagene is a very interesting molecule. Why? Because when you inject insulin glagene subcutaneously into your patient, within half an hour, 
insulin glycine is metabolized to two metabolites, the M1 metabolite and the M2 metabolite. And what is bringing about its uh, effect is the M1 metabolite. So therefore, you need to see these three graphs. So when we look at the mean serum insulin concentration profiles of the three different insulins, they appear to be superimposed upon each other. And when we look at the M1 profile, it also appears to be superimposed upon each other. But to test for the effect of the M1 metabolite, you have to do the CLAMP study to demonstrate how much of glucose you need to infuse to keep it euglycemic. And this uh, is just maybe a duplication. You know, if you have watched the, the movie Duplicate, you know, probably this is a three times duplication, as you can see, superimposed almost to near perfection. I can tell you I've never seen anything like it. Right, so the conclusion is biocons, biosimilar insulin glycine is bioequivalent to the US insulin glycine as well as the European insulin glycine and it met both the primary PK and PD endpoints in type 1 diabetes. We then uh, talked to you about INSTRIDE 1, and INSTRIDE 1 is looking at the efficacy and the safety of biosimilar insulin glycine compared to a reference insulin glycine in patients with type 1 diabetes. And most of these patients, of course, they would be taking a basal bolus regimen. So this study was run for 52 weeks, and the primary objective was to determine if biocons uh, insulin glycine once daily is non-inferior to the reference insulin glycine administered once a day in combination with rapid-acting insulin in type 1 diabetes. So this study, multi-center, open-label, randomized, parallel group, comparative phase 3, 558 patients with type 1 diabetes treated with a once daily insulin glycine for at least three months, and the A1C at screening should be less than 9.5%. And this is what we found that the mean actual HbA1c over time, looking at insulin glycine, the biosimilar insulin glycine, with the reference insulin glycine, there is no difference observed between the treatment groups. When we look at the mean actual glycine dose over time, we also see no difference between the insulin doses with these two groups. When we look at hypoglycemia, whether the incidence of any time or nocturnal hypoglycemias were uh, looked at, you find a similar profile with both the insulins. And we can actually conclude that both the basal and the bolus insulin doses did not differ in either groups. Right? So this is uh, to show the efficacy and safety of insulin glycine in type 1 diabetes. Now, insulin interchangeability, because you know, when the question comes up, how good is this insulin if we were to switch? And then maybe after we switch, you know, patient not happy, switch back again. <laughs> because this is real world, you know. You might switch and the patient is not happy and says, Doctor, I don't think this thing is working for me. I want to go back to my old one. So this study is pretty interesting and I think, you know, there are enough guidance and recommendations that if a patient were to suggest to you that he's keen or he's agreeable to switch to a biosimilar, then he should be encouraged. And therefore, this brings us to the INSTRIDE 3, or it's also known as the extension of INSTRIDE 1, where upon completion of the INSTRIDE 1 study, these patients were then, it's actually a switch study, because if I were to show you uh, how the study was uh, designed, it's again very interesting. So these patients were those who completed uh, INSTRIDE 1, and at the end of that study, they were either randomized to two arms. One arm, they did not switch at all. Whereas the other arm, the one on the upper pedal, you can see they were switched to Biocon's biosimilar glycine for 12 weeks, and then they were switched back again to the reference insulin and switch again back to biosimilar insulin glycine. So at all these time points, what did they look for? When they checked on the change in the fasting plasma glucose, uh, there were no differences. When they look at the change in the HbA1c, again, there was no difference. When they looked at whether there was a change in the basal insulin dose, again, there was no difference. So switching, you know, 
12 weeks, 12 weeks, 12 weeks. So in case the patient you know, is not happy, well, this study at least tells us you know, there's no difference. And the safety endpoints, of course, looking at hypoglycemia, you can see again, it's comparable. So we can conclude that not only from the terms of the glycemic control in the switching and the non-switching arms, both treatment sequences were well tolerated with no meaningful differences in terms of HbA1c insulin dose, adverse effects, or immunogenicity. So switching patients uh, from biosimilar, or rather from reference to biosimilar, and back again, or even going ahead again to switch, you can do it. Now, INSTRIDE 2 is similar to INSTRIDE 1, and these are patients who have got type 2 diabetes for at least a year, and they've been on a stable dose of uh, oral hypoglycemics, and uh, these patients were recruited to be randomized either to getting um, uh, the reference insulin glycine or the biosimilar insulin glycine. So a total of 580 patients were recruited in a one-to-one -one ratio, uh, half of them getting biosimilar insulin glycine, half of them getting the reference insulin glycine, and they were followed up for a period of 24 weeks. And what you can see is here the actual change in HbA1c over time at three time points, at baseline, at baseline, at 12 weeks, and at 24 weeks, with no differences. And when we look at the change in the glycine dose over time, again, no differences. Now I bring to you the experience that we had hands-on using the biosimilar insulin glycine in a mandatory Malaysian regulatory authorities demand for Biocon to conduct this study in order to get its license to come into the Malaysian market and to be used in the public sector. This is the condition that the Ministry of Health Malaysia, through the National Pharmaceutical Regulatory Authority, has imposed on any biosimilar. You don't do it? Uh, well, we're not going to give you the license. It's just simple as that. So the Malaysian experience is a 24-week post-marketing surveillance study to collect, primarily, safety and tolerability data for Biocon's insulin glycine in patients with type 2 diabetes during routine practice. So what we mean by during routine practice means a patient during enrollment can be on anything. They could be insulin naive, they could be on a premix, they could be on human basal insulin, they could be on an analog. This is reality. This is reality. Because if you are talking about switching, we have to talk about not just simply switching people on basal. Because we know that some people don't do well on premixes anyway, and we don't have much options, really. But if this is an affordable insulin that we could consider, you will see now some interesting data on how we manage to switch patients on premix insulin also. So this is a very simple study. Patients were enrolled. The HbA1c and the fasting plasma glucose were monitored at baseline 12 weeks and 24 weeks. And we collected data for any reported adverse events, including serious adverse events. Now this slide is just to show you that we also have a small number of patients with type 1 diabetes in the study. Because if you look at the uh, numbers of uh, type 1 diabetes in Malaysia, it's just about 1,000. So we also have got some patients with type 1 diabetes included in our study. The majority of them, of course, were type 2. And as you can see, half of them had very long-standing diabetes. So these were the types of basal insulin that the patients were on before they were recruited into the study. You can see the majority of them were on human basal insulin. And that would be about almost two-thirds of the patients that we recruited. There were some also on... Uh, analog basal insulin, but here's where we also recruited patients who were on premix insulin, who were not doing well. And uh, this would contribute about 10% of our total patient population. Now, these are the results. Interestingly, we found with not much active titration, we found a drop of HbA1c to the tune of about 0.9%. Uh, we also found no new safety concerns or new, no serious unexpected SAEs or serious adverse, uh, adverse events. There were no major safety concerns or new safety signals that we identified 
using the biosimilar insulin glagene. And the efficacy of these formulations in treating diabetes mellitus in Malaysia is, ex is quite expected. Uh, we thought, you know, that maybe we have put too many of our patients uh, on basal insulin and we got nowhere. And uh, we know that in some patients, perhaps, using a analog insulin which mimics or parallels the insulin profile more physiologically might really do the trick. So gives, you know, this gives us some hope you know, that in these kind of patients who are really getting nowhere, we could actually give them an opportunity to get treated. Now this beautiful uh, building, as you can see, you know, we're very uh, fortunate that we have this facility in Malaysia. It is the biggest insulin manufacturing facility in Malaysia. And uh, it has the capacity, uh, you know, state-of-the-art um, manufacturing from the crystals, going on to the producing the end product, packaging into vials, into cartridges, into pen fills. And mind you, it's no simple, uh, you know, picked out of nowhere pen fill. This is a pen fill that is manufactured by BD. It works beautifully for my patients. And this facility can produce 300,000 cartridges of insulin per day. And when we are talking about making insulin accessible everywhere, you've got to make sure you have the capacity you know, to meet that sudden surge in demand. And you must make sure that you know, insulin is a very tricky thing. You can't say, hey, hello, uh, my factory is a bit, uh, you know, uh, we've got some problems. Uh, we can't give you the stock. Nobody does that with insulin. And with this kind of production capacity, I'm sure there'll be no issues with stock at all. You know, because they are state of the art. And when we look at it, I think it is an investment. Not only, you know, they're not really investing for our Malaysian uh, population uh, tender. You know, it's, a, well, probably peanuts, if you were to say, in the American uh, perspective. It's meant for the rest of the world. So we are proud, uh, as Malaysians, uh, to have this thing stamped made in Malaysia. We're very proud. Right. And this is my last slide. As I told you earlier, we need some form of legislation, some form of protection for our patients. We can't simply have no law and you know, people can just bring in any insulin from anywhere and we really don't know how safe and how effective or we can't even know about the quality and whether this thing will indeed benefit our patients. So as you can see on this world map, the continent that needs it the most is in red. They absolutely are lawless over there as far as insulin is concerned. Well, even some of our neighboring countries, Vietnam, huge population with diabetes. Myanmar, you'd be surprised to know that the incidence of diabetes in Myanmar is as good as Malaysia, you know. When I met my friend, Professor Tin Sui Lat, he said, ah, you think you are the leaders in Southeast Asia? No, we met you. He's done his own study. So we would like, you know, for everyone, if possible, we have to champion this uh, very important uh, uh, thing that we need to get legislation to make sure that if biosimilars is the consideration, then it has to be something of value, something that works, and something that we can trust. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, I thank you for being so attentive, and I hope you will share my passion in making this work. The 10 cents mission is pure sense to me. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Radha, um, for your very insightful presentation. I mean, from my um, previous life working on HIV, I mean, we always used to talk about promiscuity and we used to say, hey, look, um, remain steady. But the one thing that I have picked up from your slides, um, pardon me for my levity here, is that switching isn't a sin, at least as far as uh, insulins are concerned here. That's the takeaway message for me, um, as I kind of um, summarize it. Professor Earl Hirsch, your turn now to continue us on this journey of thinking about where we go further along. Thank you very much. Um, I was asked to um, talk to you about insulin pricing and barriers in the United States. Just 
by way of hands. Raise your hand if you currently live in the United States. I just want to see. Just less than a handful. So you're going to find this very interesting, even for those of you who live in St. Louis, my hometown. I'm, I won't pick on my friend Janet in the audience, but I, I've become very interested in this for a long time, and um, <clears throat> putting this all into perspective for you. So in the United States, in 2013, there, were 100, there was $101 billion spent on diabetes in the United States, 101 billion US dollars, well over half of it on retail pharmaceuticals, an increase in 327% from 1996. Now these numbers are hard for me to even grasp. Most of this due to a 144% increase in spending per encounter. And if we look at that for a moment, where is this spending? It's with the prescribed pharmaceuticals. It's the green is the pharmaceuticals, ambulatory and nursing facilities, inpatient and emergency. Inpatient is where we used to spend all of our money. That has ended. And who is spending all this money? Which patient group? It's the elderly, the 65 year of age and older. That's where we're spending all of our money in the United States. And I have fun, I have had fun over the years looking at this, uh, how much we pay for insulin going back to 1960. And what I did was I looked at what a vial of insulin cost in 1960. Now, some of you may not know this, many of you may know this. In 1960, all we had was U40 and U80 insulin in the US. So I converted this to U100 insulin. I used something called Tom's Medical Inflation Calculator to see how much this costs over the course of years. And as it turned out, in 1960, um, a unit of insulin cost 0.2 cents. That's how much we paid. In 1975, it doubled. Nobody was too concerned with that. In 1983, it went up fourfold. It went up to 20 cent, or two cents for, uh, for a unit of insulin. And look what happened in 96. I picked 1996 because this was the year we received our first insulin analog in the United States, Insulin Lice Pro. My, my friend, Dr. Bolton, good to see you, Andrew. You know, you, you always make the greatest appearances. Um, so Andrew, we're talking about what has happened with insulin pricing in the US. And in 1996, nobody seemed to have too much concern when we paid four cents for a unit of Lyspro, three cents for a unit of human regular insulin. But then in 2001, I picked 2001 because that's when glargine came to the United States, but I'm still comp comparing regular insulin, which hadn't changed, Lyspro went up from four pennies to five pennies. Not bad, but look what happened in 2005. From 1996 to 2005, human regular insulin didn't go up. But now, in 2005, we have a doubling, a doubling of the cost of Lyspro. And here we are in 2017 and, and 2019, 29 cents for Lyspro. But look at human insulin. It's 14 cents for a unit of insulin. And what happened was we have another human regular insulin in the United States that you, you can still get for the 1983 cost of 2.5 cents. Not, not everybody in the United States knows about this, but this 2.5 um, cent human regular insulin is the regular insulin you can get under a brand name called Relyon at an institution Americans know as Walmart. And you can get it very cheap at Walmart, but it's the same human regular insulin. So US insulin prices have tripled from 2002 to 2013, while the other diabetes drugs have actually fallen in price. That comes from our friend Bill Herman at the University of Michigan. So this truly is a US problem. If you look at the blue, which is the United States, we're looking at human regular insulin, U100, and the other colors are France, Canada, Switzerland, even the UK, Andrew, you can see that the United States is far and above what we pay for Degladec, for example, $355. And that was in 2018. It's actually more than that now. So struggling to stay alive, rising insulin prices in the United States caused people with diabetes 
to go to extremes. And here's, here's the statistic. I want everyone to remember, in the United States, one out of four Americans ration their insulin. Now, this comes from a study from Kasia Lipska at Yale, New Haven, Connecticut. But guess what? There is a poster at this meeting, and it shows the exact same thing. In the United States, 26% of Americans ration their insulin because of the cost. And what's interesting when I looked at this poster is that it looked at all the different countries around the world, including uh, low-income and mid-income countries. We have twice more insulin rationing in the United States than low- and middle-income countries. How could that be? But that's what it is in the United States right now. So this is the death certificate of a son of a woman who's wearing a shirt that says access to insulin is a human right. This is a mom. And that's, that's what I've been saying for the last few years. Is insulin, is it a right or is it a privilege? And right now in the United States, it depends on what side of the political aisle you, you sit on. That's really what has happened with all this in the US right now. So how did we get here? How did we get to where we are right now? Because it's embarrassing. And, and if any of you have seen, been to South Dakota to seen Mount Rushmore, this is what it looks like right now. And they're talking about insulin. Um, now, this is not a new discussion. We've been talking about this longer than many of us have been on the earth. Look at this. This comes from JAMA. It was an editorial. No, I did not write it. The insulin monopoly in 1941, 1941, July 1941, this was right before the US got into World War II, this was a problem. The American Diabetes Association published this graph a couple of years ago. It actually comes from a United States uh, uh, government figure from 10 years earlier to explain to the average American how does the money flow with insulin in the United States? It's, it's a mess. Very briefly, it starts with this middle man, middle woman in this picture, the pharmacy benefit manager. Now, I, I, I say this, I'm an endocrinologist. I look at the PBM as the pituitary of everything going on with pharmaceutical pricing in the US because this is, what, this is where everything moves. I learned all about the pituitary from Dr. McGill, I, seriously. Um, I did back when I was a research fellow. But I want you to notice something here, that there's money flowing everywhere, from the drug company to the PBM, then there's this rebate to the insurance company that is from a negotiation, and eventually it may get to a pharmacy, but there's more negotiations, there are li lines, there's wholesalers, everybody wants a piece of the money, the consumer is up here in the top left, but what the ADA took out of their graph that the government had in theirs was there was a doctor writing the prescription because in the US you need a prescription for insulin. There's no physician in this picture because the physician is not part of this complex system anymore because it's all about the we get the patients what we can, whether it's the insurance that will allow it or whatever the patient can afford. It's really a system that is out of control. And a lot of us um, have put our, um, pointed our fingers at the pharmaceutical industry, and I don't think that's completely fair, because what the ADA also published, because of these rebates that go between the PBM and the pharmaceutical companies and the payers, actually the amount of money that the insulin companies are making are going, is going down. The price of insulin is going up, the pharmaceutical companies in the US are making less, who's making the money? Who's making the money? Well, the PBMs are making a lot of it, but they're not the only ones. But it's, it's like we are saying right now in the US, even as we are going through this political turmoil in the US, follow the money, because that's it. Our system is in disarray, accounting for the differences between list pricing and the net pricing. And, and it's these rebates that are really what's causing this problem. $106 billion, again, I can't think, I don't know what that number means. It's too big. If I can't, 
if it's not a number I use to balance my checkbook, I don't understand it. And I definitely don't use this number to balance my checkbook. But it's $106 billion for total B rebates and discounts given in 2015 and only, only, quote unquote, 67 billion in 2013. This is why the cost of the drugs are going up so quickly. It's because of these rebates, and so the pharmaceutical manufacturers have to increase the list price so they can give a bigger rebate. That's sort of the crux of what is happening here. So who's to blame? Everyone wants their profit to go to the highest profit margins. So here's, here's what happens in the US with the pharmaceutical companies in general. The pharmaceutical companies make a very healthy profit, 20% profit margin, but the pharmacy benefit managers they have an 85% profit margin, 85%. That's according to the Wall Street Journal. I don't think this is fake news. I, I, I can't fathom an 85% profit margin, but that's what's happening. But we need to consider another group, at least I think we do. Putting this into perspective, there is this website that I happen to find out about called opensecrets.org. It's addictive when you get on this. Um, lobbying money to Congress present for the past 20 years for pharmaceutical health care for 30 years. All of this information is coming from these public records that go on this website called opensecrets.org. Because I was very curious for the lobbying to the Congress, to the lawmakers, the senators and the congressmen and congresswomen, how much money is going for this lobbying? This is what I didn't understand. So what I did was, I calculated going back 30 years how much per year money is going to the lawmakers from the healthcare industry. So this is both technology and pharmaceuticals. The website didn't break it up. And as it turned out, when you look at this, I decided to compare healthcare to the National Rifle Association, the NRA. And, and as it turns out, there is a threefold increase in lobbying money from the pharmaceutical healthcare than from the NRA. I mean, this is what the website says. I mean, I did the calculation, but that's the calculation when you go and you look at the information. This is the problem in our country, and nobody really understands this. So what to understand about antitrust laws? Now, I never thought I'd be talking to an international audience about US antitrust laws. And by the way, for the record, I am not a lawyer, and I don't play one on TV. But you need to understand that U.S. antitrust law is a collection of federal and state government laws that regulates the conduct and organization of business corporations generally to promote fair competition for the benefit of consumers. Now, that's something that you don't see anywhere. The benefit of consumers, in our case, people with diabetes. What does this have to do with insulin? Well, this next slide I showed at an ADA meeting in 2015, and for the first time, I got called by antitrust lawyers when I showed this slide. It's not my slide. I, I got it from 2015 in May, glargine and Dedimir price per vial. It's called shadow pricing. Glargine, this is Atlantis here in blue, and then when Dedimir came out in 2006, you see that literally the, it was the same day one went up, the other went up at the same time. This is called shadow pricing, and the question is, is this collusion? And that's what the antitrust is all about. Are they, are they doing this behind the doors with each other's knowledge about it? Okay, so none of us individually can change this dysfunctional system. How do we help our patients? Well, human insulin, NPH and regular insulin can be purchased for $25 a vial, now at two pharmacy chains in the United States, it's very different than $150 for that same insulin at every other pharmacy. Some states require a prescription for this low price. It's, it's very funny how this works in the US. As a rule of thumb, you don't need a prescription for human insulin in the United States, but you do for analogs. And pH insulin, when starting insulin compared to glargine, more nocturnal hypoglycemia, now this is type 2 diabetes, when bringing the A1C from 8.6 to 6.9. This was uh, Julio Rosenstock and Matt Riddle's treat-to-target study. There's more nocturnal hypoglycemia. 
no doubt about it. That's been shown also with Detamir that there's more hypoglycemia with NPH than Detamir. We know this is true, but there's no differences in hemoglobin A1C. What about real world data? What can we say? Well, Kaiser Permanente of Northern California has real world data. Again, this is just type 2 diabetes. Over 25,000 people starting basal insulin at Kaiser Permanente. This was not a randomized clinical trial. Physicians had the option of either starting their patients on NPH insulin when they started insulin or glargine. The primary endpoint was hypoglycemia emergency department visit or hospital admission for hypoglycemia. And when you compare NPH to analog insulin, as it turns out, there was no significant difference between the hypoglycemia. And as a matter of fact, both groups started with an A1C of 9.4%. NPH resulted in a lower A1C by 0.22% because the N was so big, it was statistically significant but not clinically significant. But the point is, is that in this real world of type 2 diabetes, at least for emergency room visits. Now, that's sort of a crude endpoint because we don't know how much hypoglycemia happened at home. Most hypoglycemia is treated at home, but at least for these emergency room visits, um, there, there was no difference. What about mealtime insulin, human regular insulin versus rapid acting analogs? And we learned a lot about this when we first had Lyspro, but all those glossy prints we saw were with type 1 diabetes. What about type 2 diabetes? If we look at 13 randomized controlled trials meeting the criteria of rapid acting analog versus human regular insulin, what you see is this very meta-analysis with these very wide confidence intervals. And it showed there's really no difference in A1C. It was 0.1% favoring analog. I would argue 0.1% is not significant. It's not clinically significant. but no difference in severe hypoglycemia. The odds ratio was 0.61, but these are very large confidence intervals. And so this is a very important point in type 2 diabetes. We don't have data that analog mealtime insulin has any advantage. So we must be using more human insulin understanding this in the US, right? Wrong. Human insulins account for less than 10% of the US insulin prescriptions down from 22% in 2009. So we're actually using less human insulin. It's not due to lack of trying. I've written articles in JAMA with Tracy Tiley, who's a junior faculty at the University of Washington. I wrote this article with Kasia Lipska from Yale and Matt Riddle from the University of Oregon. And um, we're still not getting the message in the US. I would argue there's a crisis with or without affordable insulin we do have a real crisis in the United States. And again, it's hard not to get political, so I will just point out if we look at, it's one thing when the co-pays are too high, but my bigger concern is what's been happening in the last few years to our uninsured. We are just under 14% uninsured. That was as of December of last year. It's gonna be higher this year. You have somebody with newly diagnosed diabetes, type one, and they have to go on insulin, this is not sustainable. 18 to 34 year olds in this study have an uninsured rate of 21.6% in the US. That's my concern, completely uninsured. What's next, follow on biologics. We now have one with uh, Glargine, we have one with Lyspro, but the price of this is minimally different from Lantus and Humalog. We have generic Lyspro. That's not changing, that's not moving the bar at all. We're about to get generic um, aspart. I don't think that's gonna change anything. Generic is typically for small molecules, not interchangeable by the FDA rules. Biosimilar insulins in 2020 in the US, not exact replica, but as we heard, interchangeable. So, where I live in Seattle, right here where the pointer is in the corner, we can spend this amount for a vial of insulin, or we can drive two hours north and pay $28. That's what it is. So to conclude, 
Our current healthcare system in the U.S. is broken, particularly as it pertains to medications. Insulin pricing has received much well-deserved attention, as for the first time, access has resulted in rationing. Andrew and Janet and everybody in the audience, you're all welcome to visit us in our new uh, institute right here, um, right next to Amazon. Thank you all. Thank you very much. One of the most difficult jobs of, um, of helping a session go along is to hold up the one minute or two minute left um, board, especially when you're personally enjoying the presentation. And, and I think we're just getting onto a roll. Um, if I were writing headlines, the first one for me was switching isn't a sin. The second one that I'm gonna pull out there's tons of stuff that have been said, but um, the one that I would like to say is um, in the richest economy of the world or anywhere else on the planet, struggling to stay alive is a question that should not even be asked. It should be a de facto right to stay alive, and we need to do everything to make that happen. Thank you, Professor Hirsch, for um, your presentation. Folks, I want to recognize the presence of uh, Professor Bolton. He's managed to um, free himself from his board meeting, and he's with us. Uh, may I ask you to join us on the um, stage, please? Um, because you're one. I'm happy to sit here. You're happy to sit here and, <laughs> and watch the thing, right? I mean, it's a bigger screen. Okay, um, that's fine. Renza, you're up next. And folks, um, in the same way that we have paid attention to the first two speakers. We present uh, Renza Shabila from Melbourne, Australia. Your Thanks. time. Thanks. I have heard Earl speak probably a dozen times, maybe more, and I've never heard you speak about antitrust laws, so you might want to work that into your, um, into your sessions from now on. I mean, you're a very hard act to follow. So, um, my name is Renza Shabilia. I live with type 1 diabetes and I'm from Melbourne, Australia, and right now I'm really, really happy that I don't live in America, even though it is one of my favourite places to visit. Um, and uh, I work for Diabetes Australia, where I am the manager of Type 1 Diabetes and Consumer Voice. I've worked in diabetes healthcare organisations now for over 18 years. Um, and I also am an advocate, I'm an activist, I'm part droid because I am wearing three medical devices strapped to my body at the moment. And I'm also a health professional wrangler. Yeah, I know, bit of fun. Is this going to work? Because I like to move around, so yes. So I'm actually talking about something that apparently is quite simple. Really simple. It's uh, talking about improving care and quality of life for people with diabetes. Super, super simple, right? So, um, health professionals in the room, put up your hands and tell me, do you consider yourself to be offering people living with diabetes that you see person-centred, because I don't really like the name patient, person-centred care? Who thinks that they do? Okay, I don't know whether to be relieved or worried that only one person has raised their hand right now. <laughs> Let's see. So, when you Google the term um, patient-centred care, and I'll, I'll just explain, I don't really like the term patient because it makes us sound passive and it makes people living with diabetes sound like we're not actually active and part of our care, that we're, we're just lying there waiting and that's really not what it's like. We'll talk about that a little bit before. But... Um, this is uh, what you get. You get these sorts of images and it's all about, you know, the person is at the centre of our care. All of these are from different organisations. Um, apparently there are eight dimensions of patient-centred care from one organisation, which sounds a li little bit twilight zony, but that's okay. Um, but all, they're very, very confident and very, they will tell you, because it's in their mission statements, that they are all about putting the person with diabetes at the centre. But the reality is actually a lot more like this. It really, really is. This is a New Yorker cartoon and, uh, you know, that, that's kind of what it looks like a lot of the time is that we're sitting there but everybody is facing away from us, often because they are type busy, busily typing on computers. Um, so, there was this time that I needed tyres because my car had, uh, you know, had a flat tyre. So, this was the perfect example for me of, of, of what person-centred was about. I drove into the uh, into the tyre place uh, I told them what I, what I needed. I was greeted by a very, very friendly and helpful um, tyre mechanic. 
uh, told him what I needed. He gave me some options. He, you know, gave, informed me about what those options were. I got to choose. He said, it won't be a problem if, um, you know, I said, I haven't made an appointment. He said, not a problem. We can fit you in. It's not a problem at all. Um, I left my car. He, he kept me updated throughout the day. And at the end of the day, I went and picked up my car. New tyres. They were very polite. They were lovely. They told me how much it was going to cost. I was fully prepared. I knew all my expectations were managed and it worked really, really well. Now, I know that diabetes is not the same as getting tyres. I know that seeing a health professional is not the same as going to see my local guy at the Bridgestone Tire Place on the corner. However, I do think that we can get better at this sort of care that we're taking, um, that, that we're giving people. So, um, I needed to see a new GP. You don't need to read all of this. This is just to, to give you an idea. But my GP, who I'd been seeing for a number of years, moved to Darwin. I live in Melbourne. If you know anything about Australian geography, that's a very long way away and very inconvenient. Um, so I needed to find a new GP. So I rang um, a number of different GPs. So I'm really, you know, having type 1 diabetes and being me is quite difficult when it comes to finding a primary care physician because I don't want a GP who's going to talk to me about diabetes. I have an endocrinologist that I see. She deals with the diabetes. My um, GP is not allowed to do that. Um, so I needed to find a GP who understood that and was quite happy and would accept that. So this um, was the list of things when I rang a GP surgery. Now this was on on the on hold message. I'd never spoken to anyone yet, but this was them giving me a, a list of the things that their clinic demands. I'm just going to get some water. Sorry, I'm very clumpy. Thanks. The thing is, before this big list came, they made the grand announcement that they were a community pharmacist that was all about patient-centred care. And I, I listened to this message while I was on hold, waiting to make an appointment for the first time to see a new GP. I went, there is nothing patient-centred in there at all. This sounds like a nightmare. Find yourself a new GP, Renza, which is exactly what I did. Um, so we do a dance when it comes to healthcare. So if I need to see a new specialist, um, I have to go to my GP, not the one with the shopping list of things that I need to agree to before I will go there. They will write me a referral. So if I ring to make an appointment, the first question is, do you have a referral? No, I don't have one. Well, we can't make an appointment until you have a referral. You need to go to your GP. I don't have a GP. Find a GP. So there's a little dance that we do first. Then I get the referral and I ring back and I'm like, hey, I've got the referral. We need to see the referral, fax it to us. At which point I say, no, because it's not 1989. So how else can I get it to you? Faxes and healthcare is something that will confuse me forever. I do not understand why it is still the chosen way for us to actually be able to communicate with healthcare professionals. So usually I then have to go and drop it in. Um, they won't let me email it because that's dangerous, whereas, you know, a fax machine, it could roll off the bottom of the fax machine and no one would ever see it again. Um, so once I've done that, then they will make an appointment for me, maybe, but possibly not until six months' time because there's no time. So tough if it's urgent. Um, and that's just the start. The dance goes on and on and on. Once we eventually walk in there, we are given a huge clipboard with five million different things to do and then, you know, quite another New Yorker cartoon. Um, you know, we miss our appointment because we're, uh, we, we filled in so much. See? It's super duper simple, right? Right? Yeah. Um, now, here's the thing. Here's a sign, a symbol that I'm sure is very, very familiar to you all, which it is the blue circle of diabetes, and thankfully I'm seeing a lot of people wearing them on their lapels. I'm not. Um, I forgot to put one on today. But th this one has a tiny little slither cut out of it. Does anyone know what that, rec what that um, is referring to? Oh, okay, all the diabetes advocates down the back, put your hands down. Okay. That's the number of time, that's the amount of time each year that we get to spend with our healthcare professionals. Okay? So this was um, developed by Manny Hernandez, who is an incredible diabetes advocate from the US. Manny's actually receiving the award lecture for the Living with Diabetes, or giving the award lecture tomorrow for the um, Living with Diabetes stream, and I would really encourage you all to come along and hear him. But this is the thing, we are doing this all on our own. Okay? And there is a lot to do when it comes to diabetes. How much? This. 180 
diabetes-related decisions that we make every single day, okay? So that doesn't include, you know, what shoes we're going to wear, which, what colour frock we're going to wear, how we're going to wear our hair, whether I'm going to have a coffee, a latte or a cappuccino for breakfast. All of those sorts of questions, they're all on top of this. This is just diabetes-related stuff that we have to do every single day. That's a lot, right? So when we're talking about adding on top of that all of the extra things that we need to do just to help have care sort of fit around us, which it never does, we have to fit around it. It's adding to that burden. So what are some of the things that, you, that we have to do and that we think about? You don't need to read all of these either. But here are just some of them. So these are all of these diabetes things. You know, it's engaging with our healthcare professionals. It's attending appointments. Um, it's hooking up to the newest technologies. It's getting enough sleep, but wait, there's more. It's also, is my meter reading accurately? Why is my CGM squealing at me? Why was your CGM squealing at you before down the back? Um, if I go for a walk with the dog right now, will I go low? All of these things, but we're still not done. These are some more things. Um, why am I hypo at 3 a.m. Um, when I just want to sleep? Um, is my pump out of warranty? Am I cranky because my glucose is high or low, or am I just being cranky? See how simple diabetes is? It's so simple, right? So the thing is that living with diabetes... Diabetes is never going to be the only thing in our life. But the diabetes part means that we have to wear so many different hats. We have to be incredibly talented, skillful mathematicians. And I kind of hate that my year 12 um, advanced mathematics teacher, Mr. Tossolini, was right when he told me that I would be using calculus and algebra all the time because I am doing all of that. Um, I need to keep calm and be an adv advocate because if I don't do that, who else is going to do it for me? Uh, I have to become an IT expert, almost. Um, I have to become the most sophisticated um, personal assistant ever because I have so much that I need to keep track of when it comes to diabetes. Do I have enough diabetes supplies? Have I had my A1C checked? All of these sorts of things. I am fluent in English and diabetes, which should be a language that is recognised. I also need to be an incredibly smart sleuth to work out what's real and what is rubbish that I keep reading about because apparently Khloe Kardashian says that cucumbers cure diabetes and I can tell you now they don't. I know this because I like cucumbers and I still have diabetes. Um, oh, let's go to the next one. Okay. Um, also, um, I ha we have to become incredibly sophisticated engineers. The tools that we're providing people with diabetes to replace a functioning pancreas are not up to the task, um, and it's not about people failing. And that was said by David O'Neill, who's an endocrinologist from Melbourne, and yet we do get blamed when things go wrong, when our, you know, when our pump's not working, when all these sorts of things happen. But we need to be engineers to try and work out what's going on. Some of us are trying to build our own, you know, do-it-yourself do systems because that's what seems to work best. We are wearing many hats. And we also need to become the most amazingly sophisticated data analysis because have you got any idea how annoying it is to have a device giving you your glucose data every five minutes and then expecting you to act on it? So this is just day-to-day -day life with diabetes. We need things that are going to make it easier for us, as easy as easy as possible, because otherwise we get to this stage. So this, I wear CGM. I wear a pump, and I also have a Riley link attached to me because I am using a DIY loop system. I'm really comfortable with all of these things now, and I can't imagine being without them. But this is where I was maybe four or five years ago. CGM was so overwhelming when I was wearing it that I couldn't do it. I, I just, I was so burnt out, I was so burnt out that the thought of having this device strapped to me was so overwhelming. And yet I was having these shocking, like terrible, terrible hypos. Um, I was awake in the middle of the night because I was low. My husband was awake in the middle of the night forcing fruit juice down, forcing me to drink fruit juice. Um, you know, I was worried because I had a kid and, you know, she was seeing me hypo. And when I wasn't hypo, of course, because I'd overtreated those hypos because I was having those whole eat the kitchen hypos, I was then really high and feeling terrible because I was really high. And um, my husband's a musician and so he's not home a lot of time at night and he had a week of shows. And... Um, 
I've never, I, I don't fear diabetes. I don't fear going low. I don't, I'm not worried that every time as I put myself down to sleep, I'm not going to wake the next day. That's not where I am. But I do understand and did understand the value of wearing a CGM for my own peace of mind and comfort. But I was so overwhelmed. This is what I had to do. I had to write myself a list to make myself understand that I could actually wear a CGM again because I was so overwhelmed. I had to tell myself they're only numbers. Um, it's only, you know, I can take it off if I want to. I can turn off the alarms, the high alarms. Um, all of these sorts of things. We think about diabetes so much as a clinical, and if it's all about the clinical and the physical side of things, it is so much more than that. It is so much more than that. And this is where my head was at the time that I was trying to think about being able to wear this device. We don't talk about this sort of stuff enough. So when we're talking about how we can improve diabetes care, we need to ensure that it's a holistic approach that we're taking when we're talking about and to people with diabetes. It's never just about the numbers. It's never just about the diabetes. There's always so much else going on. I've been seeing the same endocrinologist for 18 years. She couldn't get rid of me if she tried, and I've told her she's never, ever allowed to um, uh, retire. Um, I named my daughter after her. They share the same middle name. That is how much I admire this woman for a number of reasons. Um, but one of them was because when I saw her, I hadn't had diabetes for that long. I'd only been living with diabetes for about three and a half years when I saw her. And um, I walked into her room and um, I said... Um, I'm here because I want to have a baby and I want to get well enough to have a, have a kid. And um, I've been told you know about diabetes and pregnancy, but um, I have brittle diabetes. And she looked at me and she said, I don't really like that word. And I, what? I said, I've got brittle diabetes. I've been told I have brittle diabetes. And, and that means that I'm, you know, that my diabetes is really hard to deal with. And, and I, need, I, I, I need to work out how I can be well enough to have a baby. And she said, you know what? I think that we've probably got a bit of work to do because I don't like the term brittle diabetes. I think that people use that word because it's hiding what's really going on. So after about 15 minutes, she said to me, have you ever spoken to a psychologist or a counsellor or a psychiatrist? Have you ever spoken to anybody about how you feel about living with diabetes? And I said, no, no, no. I, no one's ever suggested that. No one's ever said that that might be an idea. And she said, you know, let's stop talking about diabetes and let's get you a referral to a psychologist. And I said, sure, okay. That was where my whole attitudes towards diabetes had completely turned around at that point in time. That was a point in time that I understood that it was okay to grieve, my life was going to be different, and not necessarily in a bad way, but it was going to be different. And that I could, that I, it was okay to kind of say goodbye to my life beforehand. Now, there's actually somebody in this room who I had a conversation with once about the terms that we use when we're describing diabetes because the words that had been used when I was first diagnosed were, you're going to live a perfectly normal life with diabetes and that's absolutely fine. You don't have to stop doing anything. And this person said, I think we actually did a really big disservice to people living with diabetes when we started saying you can live a normal life with diabetes. And that's not to say that people with diabetes can't be amazing and do incredible things and, and be, you know do everything that they want to do. But there is nothing normal about injecting yourself with insulin every day. There is nothing normal about pricking your fingers a dozen times a day to see what your glucose level is. There is nothing normal about having to be a mathematician to try to work out if I eat this many carbs at this time of day and I'm taking the dog for a walk that's this far and also I'm feeling a bit stressed and I've got my period, how much insulin do I possibly need to take? There is nothing normal about humans needing to do this. So I think that the way that we talk about diabetes and the way that we think about diabetes and the way that we treat diabetes when we uh, people with diabetes when we focus too much on just those numbers that's what's making our lives so so difficult so I'm going to talk about words and I'm going to talk about language because I'm almost contractually obliged to do that. I work for Diabetes Australia and we launched the world's first diabetes language position statement eight years ago. We um, are very, very big advocates about using language that empowers people, that presents diabetes in a positive way, that doesn't treat people with diabetes like idiots, that um, understands that people with diabetes are integral and central to their, to their care and promotes that people with diabetes need to have choice. The words we use matter. So I don't ever want to be called a diabetes sufferer. 
I just certainly don't want to be called a diabetic sufferer. Uh, I have done, I can still remember doing a, um, a, a TV interview and I said, um, so when you, um, you know, when you've got the thing down the bottom, they, they asked me actually, they said, what would you like to say? And, well, Renza Shabilia and live with diabetes for however long. I said, please, I would prefer that you don't use the term diabetic and please don't call me a sufferer. Sure enough, I was on the six o'clock that news that night, Renza Shabilia, diabetic sufferer. So they got both of them in there, which was great. Awesome. Our words do matter. Um, so please never use the word compliant again. Thanks. And that was from Kelly, who's lived with diabetes for 10 years. Um, compliant is such a dirty word in diabetes. It really is. Don't use the word compliant. And also, adherent means the same thing. So don't just swap out the words. Um, Kerry Sparling, who is a very well-known diabetes advocate, and she was an incredible blogger. She doesn't write her blog anymore. She says, my pancreas is not compliant. I'm not non-compliant. And I agree with that wholeheartedly. Um, but there are other words that are really problematic. I mean, calling somebody non-compliant sounds like they are willfully disobeying the rules and regulations of their healthcare professional when it comes to diabetes. I'll let you into a little secret. There are no rules when it comes to diabetes. Diabetes flies in the face of rules. So um, non-compliance is a terrible, terrible word. And there was one of the presentations earlier today, somebody was referring to people with diabetes in a study as subjects. We're not subjects, we're people or particular Participants, we participate in um, research. We're not subjects. Um, so thinking about those sorts of things. Now, you might think that really doesn't matter. Actually, it does. We're living with this every minute of the day. So when you're talking about diabetes and people with diabetes, it's kind of personal to us. So that's something to think about in your day-to-day -day life. Um, somebody did notice earlier that on the back of my phone, it actually has the phrase deliberately non-compliant. Um, and that came about after I gave a talk to a group of healthcare professionals about um, the fact that I was using a, a do-it-yourself artificial pancreas system. And um, it I horrified a lot of the people in the room. And um, Tim Skinner, who is a fabulous health um, psychologist, afterwards said, you know, the problem is you've gone from just being non-compliant and not doing what you're told to being deliberately non-compliant to going and finding um, solutions to, um, you know, to, to, to make your diabetes better, I guess. So just finishing up with a couple of things. So find your tribe, love them hard. If you're a healthcare professional and you're working with people with diabetes, please ensure that they understand and know about peer support and how valuable that is. There is nothing like being able to surround yourself with people who get it intrinsically. You guys are all amazing with the work that you do and you understand diabetes at a very theoretical level, but I need to talk to my friends and peers who are living with diabetes so that my own diabetes makes sense. Because seriously, diabetes doesn't make sense at all. Um, and this is from somebody who says, those in the diabetes online community are my friends around the world. And they're so helpful because they're there 24 seven, 365. And this is what I say. I think this is the second time that this has actually got a viewing in this room today, this um, tweet, is peer support is as much of a part of my diabetes care plan as the drugs I take, the healthcare professionals I see, and the magic devices I use. My head would not be in the safe space that it is if it wasn't for my friends and peers living with diabetes. And apologies for my language, but seriously, sometimes you've got to laugh about diabetes. Humour, laughter is the best medicine. This keeps all of my diabetes supplies that I carry around with me in my bag together to make sure that I've always got a backup if something goes wrong. But I'd also like to just really quickly, and I am out of time, address my privilege because I'm in a country where I do not need to worry about the cost of insulin. And... I do not need to worry about accessing test strips and I do not need to worry about not being able to get supplies for my insulin pump. We need to check our privilege as people living with diabetes who are fortunate enough to not have these concerns. But here's the bottom line. I've just spoken to you for ages about diabetes. I am so not about my diabetes. Diabetes will never ever be the most important thing in my life. All of these other things are far, far more important. My travel, my friends, I bake all the time. I bake best cookies in the world. I wear far too many stripes, which I'm not doing today. And this is my family, my gorgeous daughter, who looks very, very suspicious, even though her parents are incredibly cool and she should acknowledge that. This is what is important. I need to be healthy and happy. I need to have care systems around me that support me as 
best as possible. My quality of life has to be really strong because I need to be great for these people because they're the ones who are really important to me. And you can, it's not simple, but you can find me at diabetogenic.wordpress.com where I swear too much. I apologise for that. But I really, I write all about real life with diabetes. It's pretty raw at times, but if you want to know what real life with diabetes is about, that's where you can go to get it. Thank you so much. I'm sorry I went over time. Folks, she needs a lot of applause, please. Renza, there's an old Bee Gees song. It's only words. <laughs> it's not only words. It's not only words. Thank you very much. That's such a pointed reminder to each one of us to be mindful because it's only words, and words are all we have to take each other's hearts away. Thank you for um, touching each of us. You've heard that song, right? Betrays my age. It's simple. That's the headline, right? What's simple? We need to care enough so that the details are not where we trip up. That it's not patience, it's not um, subjects, it's not um, somebody we do something to, but it's people with lives, aspirations, and many, many things to get done that we are walking alongside and have the privilege of shaping their everyday realities. Thank you so much. We are missing our fourth speaker who was scheduled to be in the lineup and who was there, whose name is there on the flyers. Um, we are missing and our, our thoughts are with uh, Dr. Shashank um, Joshi, who is flying back to India. Um, with a very sick, um, dying father. And so we keep him in our minds and our thoughts. And we have very ably replacing him, Dr. Sandeep Athalia from Biocon, the Chief Medical Officer of Biocon. Your time starts now. Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Mm. Okay. So, uh, after a very inspiring talk by Renza, and I think great facts put by Earl, and uh, clinical trial data by uh, Earl Good Speakers, I think uh, I'm going to touch base on a few topics that are complementary to what we have seen here. Uh, as you know, uh, uh, Dr. Shashank is uh, not available here today, but uh, I'll try to fill in his shoes. So if you think of 50 most important life-saving breakthroughs in history, right, 50. So they could be water desalination to renewable energy to internet. Of all the things, in the top 50 things, insulin discovery stands in one of those 50. And I think uh, these are ranked by the number of lives that these discoveries have actually saved. So I think this is incredibly important uh, of why we have uh, this topic today. And uh, uh, coming back to why insulins, I think uh, because it's just the number of people, the morbidity uh, that it impacts uh, globally. If, on, if you see on the left side, I think it just, just shows you uh, the before insulin initiation and after insulin initiation curves. And, and clearly, I think there is a, a reduction in HbA1c levels that is undisputed as uh, it has been proven across geographies, uh, across uh, many publications. And on the right side, what you see is uh, disease-adjusted life years. And these are basically the the number of years that have been prevented uh, that are affected by the disease. So if you look at uh, uh, Asia particularly, I think this stands out really high because in, in, in the year 2030, if the disease continues the way it is with the introduction of insulin, these are the number of 330,000 DLYs per year would be saved by insulin, would be prevented by insulin if we actually target these patients at the 7% HbA1c level. So this, 
So the need for early introduction of insulin in the therapy, uh, on the left side you can see uh, how the, the life cycle of a patient, uh, of a type 2 patient, uh, that starts uh, on, on, on therapy. So uh, initially with the diagnosis, you start with the diet and exercise, uh, the patients are motivated, and then basically uh, there is a reduction in the HbA1c. What happens next is slowly the disease creeps up. The HbA1c rises again, then they go on uh, an oral anti-diabetic therapy. So there is a single drug, the same thing happens again. There is control for some time, and then the HbA1c creeps up again. Then they go on two medications, then they go on three medications. And then there comes a point where there is introduction of insulin. If you see on the right side, this is basically the graph which shows that it takes about 10 to 12 years for insulin initiation in a type 2 patient. And when does that happen really? Because over time, when you, when you go on these oral monotherapies, uh, uh, two, two and three uh, products, uh, oral, oral diabetics, uh, there comes a point where the disease keeps becoming worse in the background. The HbA1c control is not good, and there comes a point where you have the first incident the first cardiovascular event like a myocardial infection. And that is the time in the patient's life where that is significant. That is the time when the patient realizes that I am not well. Because typically a type two patient is just like you and me. They are fully functioning, they are, they are, they are, they are not suffering on a day-to-day -day basis. But I think at that point, there is a realization that this is serious and that, that's the time when the in insulin gets initiated. And by that time, what happens is that the complications are growing in the background. So what happens if you actually introduce insulin? If you see the blue line there, uh, that early introduction of insulin would cause reduction in HbA1c right at that moment. At year two, you could see a reduction in uh, HbA1c and then the morbidity that goes on in the background would be avoided. So the increasing the risk of a diabetic uh, goes on with time, and I think the key message here is uh, it is possible to avoid these complications, to avoid the morbidity by early introduction of insulin. That takes me to the next slide, which shows the timely introduction of insulin. With just a one percentage reduction of HbA1c, you can achieve a reduction in the risk of microvascular complications by 37%, reduction in retinopathy incidence by 76%, microalbuminuria or uh, renal disease by 62%, and neuropathy by 50%. So it clearly shows that just a reduction of 1% can make and such a big impact. And these are the complications that, that bring the patient to more severe therapy they bring, to, bring a patient into hospitalization, and obviously in the healthcare system, most of the expenses happen when these things occur. So on the right side, the table shows what happens when an insulin is introduced with one OAD, two OADs, or three OADs in the life cycle of this patient. So when you introduce insulin with a single, so consider metformin and an insulin given together, an early introduction of insulin will basically reduce the HbA1c by 1.7%, and the percentage of patients reaching the glycemic target are 40%. And as you go on, as you try to delay the introduction of insulin, which is typically what happens in regular patients, uh, because patients want to avoid injections, and I think they keep delaying until they come to a point where they take uh, insulin. So when you give insulin with two OODs, the reduction is 1%. Uh, it, uh, the, the patients reaching glycemic index also are reduced to 25%. And then with the third, it comes down even further. So this just shows that reduction in HbA1c early is important. I think reduction in HbA1c can re result into reduction of morbidity. And early insulinization is something that is very important. If you look at the out-of-pocket costs for any type 2 diabetic in the US, 
uh, it's about $360. I think uh, we, we, we saw a lot of numbers from Earl today. Uh, in India, it's uh, $112, Japan, 70 and so on. Uh, but on the right side, you can see uh, that from 2002 to 2013, the average price of insulin has nearly tripled. And the high price of insulin has made the drug out of reach for many patients. Uh, for, for most of us who are here, uh, I know they are not from US, uh, many of our countries are not fully covered by insurance. And I think uh, a lot of our patients are paying out of pocket. And this graph actually addresses that. With the tripling of insulin prices and patients paying out of pocket, this is getting more and more difficult. The incidence and the prevalence of the disease is increasing. And at the same time, the insulin pricing is reducing the access to insulins. These are numbers from uh, a Lancet uh, article. 33 million people with T2DM do not have access to insulin in the world. And by 2030, this number will touch 41 million. So if you see the right side uh, of, the, of the slide, uh, uh, people requiring insulin in the world, it's about 79 million by 2030. And out of those 79 million, people will access to insulin would be only 38 million. And this is if we continue to do what we do today. So at the current levels of insulin access, they're uh, highly inadequate uh, compared to the projected needs. And this particularly affects Africa and Asia. See the, see the graph on the right side. Uh, uh, the, the innovator companies, the three insulin manufacturers, totally represent about 88% of total registrations globally. And these are basically product registrations that you see on the, on, in the graph. Uh, the, the analogs are, uh, are in red and uh, the human insulin uh, is in blue. And uh, low income countries, upper uh, middle income countries and high income countries. Those are the three columns. And what is a clear message here is that the number of approvals are the highest in the high income countries and lowest in the low income countries. And, and whereas the number of patients actually, the, the demography of these patients is exactly the opposite. So the number of patients actually are the highest in low income countries and the lowest in high income countries, just by the population demographics. So what does that say? That these companies are focused on certain markets and around 60 countries imported insulin from only one country for at least one year. And then making the access vulnerable to disruptions. So I think uh, there, is, uh, there are 60 countries who do not have insulin manufacturing presence in those countries and they're purely importing that from one single country. And I think uh, based on the location, based on the capacity to pay, they are uh, vulnerable for disruptions in supply. So it's a global problem statement. The World Health Organization says the people with diabetes who depend on life-saving insulin pay the ultimate price when access to affordable insulin is lacking. And the IDF has said that estimates that about 4 million people die each year uh, as a consequence of diabetes. And many of these deaths are preventable. Uh, and they could be prevented with proper access to medicines and supplies. So I'd like to spend a little time on some of the policy initiatives. I mean, we've, we've talked about uh, several things today in terms of cost, but what are the things that could be done at government levels? Uh, many of you are treating physicians, many of you are policymakers, but I think if you think of your own country, and if you think at what could be done at a governmental level, I think there are some points that I would like to discuss. So at an international and uh, national level, there are some barriers to the access of insulin and which need to be addressed. So one is a policy on biosimilars. Uh, how many countries today have a biosimilar policy? Uh, I know several uh, countries are having and are continuing to have new policies on biosimilars, but not all. Uh, there are lots of countries, especially in the low and middle income group countries, that do not have 
a policy on biosimilars. They, in fact, uh, their health authorities do not even have uh, an understanding of how to evaluate a biosimilar. So that's the gap. The second thing is the tendering and pricing and central procurement. As uh, Earl uh, described in a very uh, nice graph, how complicated access to insulin is in the United States and how many people are actually party to uh, the whole system before it reaches from the manufacturer to the patient. I think the same thing is true for other countries as well. Uh, uh, when the drug leaves the manufacturer until it reaches the patient who is paying out of pocket, how many players are actually involved in it? And I think that is one aspect that needs to be looked at. When we talk about 10 cents uh, initiative, I think this is the same kind of philosophy that uh, is it possible to imagine simplification of this access that from a manufacturer to a patient, uh, it's, it's, there are less hands involved. And I think that is the only way we can reduce the price of insulin to the patient. When we talk about a consumer, it is the patient and how, does we, how do we re, uh, actually ensure that the consumer pays less for the product? So I think tendering prices, central procurement has to be looked at. Uh, the health budget for diabetes. Uh, there is a definite budget for healthcare in any country. I think what can be done to actually prioritize diabetes in this list, because diabetes could be the sixth or seventh in your, in your country list. And I think uh, one of the things is this is something it creeps in. I mean, this is not something that happens overnight. Uh, it's not an acute thing, uh, but it has an impact on the entire population. So if you look at the population health, I think it does need a attention that it needs. So it has to be brought up in the list of priorities for any government. The national policies on markup, discounts, and the complicated distribution system, coming back to what Earl was showing, I mean, it's not just the US, there are several countries with very complicated uh, networks of how uh, the drug moves. And, uh, and, and I think simplification of these processes and bringing transparency in pricing is something that is needed today. And I'll also talk about trades and uh, taxes. Uh, uh, when you talk about moving the product from one, one country to another, uh, I think these are the kind of things that uh, affect the price of the product. I mean, uh, taxes, uh, if you have uh, affordable insulin to start with, uh, but if you consider all the taxes and levies that come across, uh, I think that just makes that product more expensive at the time. So I think for life-saving drugs like insulin, this is something to think of. Uh, in addition, I would like to just touch base on healthcare system related factors. You know, there are po the patient focused education and empowerment, uh, as Renza described, it is, it, is, it is the peer groups uh, that actually help the most. Uh, the patients actually can uh, understand other patients most. I think it is very, uh, the instructive way of uh, telling patients uh, do this, follow this diet is actually uh, puts off most patients, but I think it is important to understand what is needed in the system to really ensure that uh, there is enough support for patients. So I think patient-focused education, empowerment with the right groups is important. Uh, using technology to focus on poorly controlled patients and preventing complications. I think within the healthcare system, it, there is about 20% of those patients who are actually not controlled, and there could be reasons for them being not controlled but it is those 20% that cause 80% of the expense. So I think it is important to use technology to identify where these 20% patients are and then focus on them more. Addressing the costs beyond the product within the ecosystem. Um, you know, we always talk about drug, drug costs, but I think there are costs in the hospitals, the, the costs in, within the system that add up in the treatment of uh, diabetes. And I think those are the aspects that governments and health policies should address as well. Uh, a multi-pronged approach, the healthcare worker, educator, dietitian, all these people are really, really important to really address uh, control of diabetes. It is, uh, I agree, it is not just the numbers, uh, it's not just HbA1c, it's not just the, uh, the blood glucose levels that we all talk about in, uh, in, in our scientific papers, but it is about the overall success of uh, uh, well-being and, and success uh, of controlling the disease. 
Now I'll touch base uh, very quickly on regulatory policies promoting access to affordable insulin. So think about your countries where you come from and think about what are the regulatory policies that exist in your country to, uh, to allow uh, rapid uh, approval of biosimilars and the com to make the field more competitive. So uh, just uh, recently, the US FDA has taken steps to improve the access to affordable insulins. In November, uh, just two weeks ago, uh, we have seen the FDA release a draft guidance on accelerated biosimilar uh, and interchangeable insulins approval in the United States. Uh, what what, what uh, the specifics of that means that uh, they don't require specifically phase three trials. Uh, so it is possible to now do uh, uh, get a very strong package based on CMC data and, and phase one data. And that, I think, is scientifically sound enough for the FDA to, uh, to approve. The EMA has been uh, at the forefront in this aspect. Uh, EMA has had this guidance for last three years uh, for rapid approval of biosimilars uh, in the European Union uh, through an abbreviated pathway. These are pathways that are essential to allow for uh, insulins to make them affordable and to get to the patients quickly. So regulatory policy should focus on credible science based evaluation of products, but in an accelerated fashion. I mean, that is a real need for today. In my conclusion, I would just uh, 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 say three things. Uh, that uh, the increasing incidence and prevalence of diabetes and the skyrocketing insulin pricing prices uh, will not only burden individuals but also our healthcare systems and the economies of the countries. Uh, secondly, I think there is an urgent need of prioritizing diabetes as a national health concern and it is extremely important to put that uh, high on the list. And the third thing is improving access to high quality biosimilar insulins will help in early insulinization and thereby uh, improving overall health outcomes. So with that, I'll end my talk. And um, this is our uh, uh, banner here, unlocking the access to insulin. So uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Sandeep, um, for a detailed presentation. And literally, we've had a crescendo. So since I've done a BG song earlier, I might as well pick another song, um, which kind of summarizes for me what your presentation has been. And this is from 1985, for those of you who are old enough to remember. Um, there comes a time when we heed a certain call, and the call is simply, look, it's untenable that we are struggling with these barriers for insulin access, and we need to unlock this. Um, the time's come to hear that call. We can't go on pretending day by day that someone somewhere will soon make a change. Sorry, it's us and the many people that we need to partner with that will make that change. Thank you so much for that presentation. Capping us this evening, we have the new president of the IDF, Professor Bolton, coming along to speak to us. Um, and thank you, sir, for closing your board meeting and then coming along and being with us today. Thank you so much. and. Uh, we'd like to invite you to make your presentation. Well, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I was apparently supposed to do the introduction, so I'm sorry I'm a bit late. Uh, I'll give the introduction at the end. But it was Roosevelt, I think, who said, be upright, be forthright, be seated. So that means be short. Uh, so I'll try and do that. Uh, this is Sir Leon Donaldson, our previous chief medical officer in the UK, who said, if you always do what you always did, you will always get what you always got. So we need to change. Or we certainly need to change in diabetes. Why? Because we're facing this epidemic of diabetes across the world. Here are data from our good friend Abdul Basit, who was on the board with us last year from Karachi. Look at these data. Population-based study completed in 2017, published last year, 26.4% of adults in Pakistan with diabetes. I'm involved in a 
Dr. Dixit here with a similar a study in India, and it's going to be, if not equal, even higher. And with a population of 1.3 billion, that's a, a lot of people. But not only there, here's Venezuela, a country suffering greatly at the moment, and a country where we've been attempting to get insulin to, there are people dying without insulin in Venezuela. Prevalence, uh, again, high, 8.3%, and a country that's many starving people. Uh, Pre-diabetes is nearly 15%. But it's not only type 2, type 1 as well. Uh, here are data showing a continued increase we're seeing in these data from uh, Finland, I think, with the highest prevalent incidence of type 1 diabetes in the world. So there is a need, an urgent need, for policies that promote prevention early diagnosis and effective management of diabetes. So we have a message for our government and the world at large. We cannot afford to ignore diabetes because the human and economic costs are too high. Look at the amount of national health care budget spent on diabetes. In some poorer countries, it's huge. A large part of this is due to late complications, which should be preventable with early action. Here's our, my friend Ronald Ma from the Chinese University of Hong Kong in a review recently in diabetes care. He just spoke on diabetic complications. I was chairing a session earlier this afternoon, diabetic complications in Asia. Look at what he describes, the explosion of diabetes in this region of the world, a rising global public health tsunami. So we need people who will really speak out, well-known people, people, perhaps people with diabetes or politicians to help us. And I was fortunate a few years ago to share the stage with Sri Narendra Modi, the Prime Minister of India, at a conference in Bangalore. Remarkably, after that conference in the hotel, I ran into Earl Hirsch. In the bar, I shouldn't really say that, but in the bar. <laughs> I said, what the hell are you doing here? It's not Seattle. <laughs> yeah, well, that's right, yeah. We, at least, we worked together in Miami in 1983. I've known Earl for many years, and his wife was then my research nurse. It's quite extraordinary. And I walk into a Bangalore in a hotel and find Earl Hirsch in the bar. Anyway. A small world. world. Srin Narendra Modi got up, and he said to this conference in Bangalore, and there's 15,000 in the audience. He said, the biggest threat to our health in India is no longer malaria. It's no longer tuberculosis, HIV, AIDS. It's diabetes. And he's right. So we need champions like this. And he's re-elected, so we'll be in touch, <laughs> Mr. Modi. <laughs> I'd like to pick up a newspaper while they're still available. And this was when I've been recently, well, not recently, a few years ago, I was lecturing in Calcutta and I was on a flight back to somewhere, Abu Dhabi or somewhere, and I picked up the Times of India. Look at this. Stop the hard sell of sugary drink, an open letter to chief executives of Coca-Cola and Pepsi-Cola in India. And here, the prevalence of diabetes has doubled in 12 years in India. Can we educate our politicians? Difficult job. But some countries, and you'll be surprised to hear that one country that's done reasonably well is Mexico, Mexico. They put a big tax on sugary beverages, so far so good. Denmark failed. People got on the train and went across you know, to Malmo, 15 minutes by train from Copenhagen, and they could buy all the sugary drinks they wanted at a much cheaper price. Barclay in California, 25% tax led to a huge reduction in sales. The UK is always lethargic, and by the way, Brexit is the biggest disaster in my political lifetime. A tax bill we talked about for years, it just came in last year. So there are some hopes, but taxes is not the only way forward. We need to look at town and country planning. Look at the cities. When I was in, first in Miami, or no, first in the United States, I was at junior high school in the 1960s in Long Island, New York. And I remember going out shopping with my parents uh, at junior high school there. We went out shopping and we were walking back with the bags and the neighbor stopped and said, is everything all right? I said, yes, why? He said, well, you're not driving. Anyway, so I went back and I worked in Miami. And I realized that it's actually really quite dangerous to, to walk. You know, you cross the road, you're likely to get knocked down by a car. Then I moved back to Miami. 
I was full time there, 2002 to 4, as a visiting professor or a full time professor. And I was interested to see in the waiting room, like this, you know, in the Diabetes Research Institute. And there was a video on that people with diabetes were looking at. It said, never take the elevator, that's in English is lift, by the way, uh, if you can take the stairs. So I thought, well, this is very good advice. So I said to the guy who produced this, I said, have you ever tried to take the stairs here? He said, no, why? He said, well, you can't get out on any floor apart from the ground floor, the first floor in America, because they're all locked. You can only come down the stairs, so it's impossible. So they had to change the video. That wasn't very popular, but it was just clinical observation. <laughs> then I go out for dinner in Miami, and I see people coming out after dinner, and they give $5 to someone who goes and drives, you know, walks over there and drives the car around to them. I wonder if I move back there in the next century if people will still have legs in America. They're not needed, really. <laughs> but these are just examples. The towns, is, look at the Netherlands. Low prevalence of diabetes. People cycle. Cyclists get preference. People walk. Let's have pedestrian-free zones, cycling and so on. So let me be provocative. Is diabetes the cancer of the 21st century? Are there similarities? Well, yes. Screening of high-risk groups is effective in cancer. Same in diabetes or pre-diabetes. Long-term remissions and cures are possible in cancer. Same in diabetes. Increased public awareness has been highly effective. Now, a psychologist would kill me if I talk about fear arousal, but it's worked. Why do people go for a mammography? Because they're frightened. Why do people take a statin for heart disease? Why do they take it? They don't feel any difference because they're frightened of heart disease. So fear arousal has been effective. And we need to think carefully how we really lift the profile of diabetes. Because I bet if we had some collecting bowls, not here, but say down in a store, outside a store here in Busan, and we had three buckets collecting. Cancer, heart disease, diabetes research. I bet you that... 90 cents, or whatever, 9,001 out of 10,000 would go to cancer, perhaps 800 to heart disease, and if we're lucky, 200 to diabetes research. So we really need to change. Fear arousal has been effective. So let me give you two case histories. Male in his 60s, routine screening, high in PSA, no symptoms. Transperineal biopsy, prostate cancer confirmed, scans all clear, no metastases. Treatment, hormonal therapy, three months, brachytherapy. And then external radiotherapy, outlook, cure. Well, I can tell you now, that's me. That's me. I, just after I was elected as president, it's nothing to do with being elected as president of IDF, by the way, uh, two years ago, a routine screen, high PSA. That's me. I went through all that. What do people say? Even colleagues. Oh, my God, that's terrible. Oh, c what can I do to help? It's awful. You've got cancer. I said, well, it's not that bad. <laughs> I'm getting worried then. But now my PSA is, having been 33, is 0.3. I'm fine. A year, more than a year out. Cure. Now, look at this case history. This could be me. Male in his 60s. Routine screening, glucosuria, glycosuria. Further tests, got type 2 diabetes, examination, a bit of loss of feeling in the feet, a bit of protein in the urine. Diabetes is treated with medications. Outlook, there's no cure. And if you've got even minor complications at diagnosis of type 2 diabetes, you've got a significantly increased mortality and reduced life expectancy. What do people say? Oh, oh I've got diabetes. Oh, don't worry, my grandmother had it. It's nothing, it's just a touch of sugar. That's the problem. Now, the Sunday Times, and I think we should use the press, we should use uh, whatever media we can to promote diabetes as something that can be prevented, it can be treated early, but if it's left to the late complications, it's extremely uh, dangerous. This was the Sunday Times earlier this year, the color supplement, O oh Sugar. And here you see anybody from Europe or know the licorice all sorts, Bassett's man, but he's only got one leg. This was the next page of that supplement. The hidden epidemic of type 2 diabetes. The hidden epidemic. 
And here's the picture. Can you imagine this? In the Sunday Times, it's more like something out of diabetes care. A charco foot with a big ulcer and a chap with an amputation. And this is what he said. Cancer is serious. Heart disease is serious. But I never thought diabetes was serious at all. And now I've only got one leg. So this food for thought here. Look at these data from my group published a few years ago in a series of studies in collaboration with my good friend Larry Levery in Dallas, Texas. In Manchester, we followed just under 200 dialysis patients for two years. The overall two-year mortality, 53%. If you'd lost part of a foot or a leg, three out of four people are dead in two years. That's worse than almost every form of cancer, and yet we don't take it seriously. We don't take it seriously. That's the message. We need to do raise the profile of diabetes, politically in healthcare systems, amongst the population. We can treat it, we can prevent it, we can treat it early. Don't get it get like this. These are data from my group. So look, the mortality is hit horrendous, 290% after amputation. So 21st century diabetology, prevention is the key. Blood sugar control is important, but we mustn't forget lipids, blood pressure, etc. Up to date, accessible, affordable, consistent. Diabetes complications screening is the essential way to prevent because early on they are silent. So I'll leave you with a quote from the book of Ecclesiasticus. I was at Trinity Cathedral in Miami sometime last year. Having been bell ringing as early news, and then I went to the, the mass. This was from the book of Ecclesiasticus. Before you speak, learn. But before you fall ill, take care of your health. I think this is a nice uh, thought to go forward. So with those words, I thank you very much. Danyavad to our friends in India. Uh, nice to be here. Professor Bolton, thank you so much for um, your presentation um, and, and for the thoughts that are contained within those slides. But then the one thing that I would like to pull and, and, and um, say that's a headline for me from there is, uh, I don't know how much emphasis I can put on which syllable, but it's O oh sugar. Um, and, and, and if you say it enough times in different ways, you'll get the connotations that are seemingly to be conveyed that this is um, not something that you ignore. This is uh, s not quite snuff with situation normal all whichever way. Right. Thank you very much. We are at 7.32. We had promised to finish at 7.30. We also had thought that we would have a round of questions at least or comments from each of us, um, each of the presenters here. I don't think we have the privilege and I'm going to exercise a little bit of privilege on my side to say we shouldn't be standing in between folks and their programs beyond it. But I want to single out one person here, and that's I'm going to use my moderator privilege here. Renza. Why? It matters. What do you make of all this conversation? And what do you think? Where do you think our noses ought to be pointed? Um. Andrew, I'm so thrilled that you have taken over the IDF. I really am. So I'm going to start with that. But I am going to say that I don't think that fear arousal is the way to address diabetes. And I'm going to say that I have an alternative theory. But I would also... I'm, I'm a person living with diabetes. I work in a health organisation. But I think that the problem... I, I, firstly, you're totally right. If there were three jars... Diabetes would get the least. Diabetes gets less funding for research. In Australia, when we look at our NH and MRC grants, cancer gets far more. Diabetes has an image problem, and I think we need to fix that, but I don't think we fix that by scaring people. I think we fix that by speaking about diabetes in a way that informs people that it is serious, 
that it is so complex, but it is also not the fault of the person living with it. Because what we have done for so long is we have blamed and shamed people, and that's why no one wants to give money to diabetes, because they think, well, get off your backside, go for a walk, and you won't have gotten diabetes. I'm not supporting you. I don't care about it. We have called it a touch of sugar for too long, so people don't understand how serious and complex it is. So my thing, this is when I talk about why language matters so much, is because we speak about diabetes and we have done such a disservice to people living with especially type 2 diabetes. We have treated people living with type 2 diabetes like they have no one but themselves to blame when actually we have situations like communities not being built so that people can walk, so that they can access healthy foods, that they can live healthy lives, and yet we blame them then when things go wrong. So I think we need to look at this in a way that actually is supporting people as best as possible, not blaming them, but elevating diabetes to be a condition that everybody should be concerned about and want to do something more about. So that's it. Renza, thank you so much for uh, summing up and, and refocusing us back to where our attention needs to be, the well-being of our brothers, sisters, mothers, parents, um, children, type 1, type 2, conditions notwithstanding. It is where we collectively need to see our well-being in. I want to thank First of all, each of you folks who've spoken, I've not seen 120 minutes fly by just like that. And, and with so many laughs in between. Thank you so much for not only being informative, but also doing it in a way that kept us engaged. Thank you so much for uh, the effort that you put into um, communicating what you had in your minds. For all of you who came and sat through this conversation, thank you so much for being with us. every one of us has a part to play. And I think as we step out, let's be mindful of the words that come out from the fullness of our hearts that allow for situations to be transformed. They can be, and, and each of your words will matter. So please use them wisely and widely because change begins with each one of us. Just as much as the Biocon Biologics team led by Christiana, Amaka, thank you so much for you and your team for the way you've kind of enabled the coming together of this um, evening and also for putting I mean, that, that thing that was there on the slide, unlock, thank you for that picture, which basically says there is stuff nearly a century that's been locked up. It's, it's something that's life-saving. That's something that needs to be opened up and made much more accessible you have a, a 10 cents mission. I wanted to use that towards the end, not right at the beginning of it, but for the positive of time, there is a 10 cents mission that Biocon's calling people to join in with. Sure, there's a great plant in Malaysia and it'll produce a lot of stuff, but it's not gonna be nearly enough for the number of people that we are going to get onto the pathway of diabetes as Renza's pointing us, because our ecosystem is actually pushing people into those realities. And therefore, notwithstanding the amount of insulin that any one company can provide, it needs a lot many more people. It's going to be a partnership. We have people who live with diabetes, we have partnerships, and then we look at the way we do businesses, whether we do the policies right. Thank you, Mr. Sivan, for being with us this evening, for the encouragement that you bring, and, we, and you've probably heard from everyone a different flavor that ultimately while people and companies will try and do stuff, it, they can't do it without governments actually becoming active partners of this tripod of delivering care and well-being. It should not be a choice. It's a matter of right that people should live and live healthy. Thank you for being with us this evening. It's been a privilege to have you. My name is Bobby John. It's been my absolute pleasure to run this evening with you. Thank you very much and have a good evening. Thank you.